Before we start our talk about how the sexy monk, or at least I hope a sexy monk, basically manipulated our goal into almost naming him a Japanese emperor, I want to put a disclaimer in that I mean absolutely no disrespect to any historical figures or historical events of Japan and or anyone for that matter, it's just that people being dumb is not a new concept and <laughs> historical figures being dumb dumbs it's actually like it happened in every country and just because this channel focuses mainly on Japan. I'm gonna talk about the Japanese historical figures in here and just so you know, it's probably going to become a series because oh boy, people are just so dumb sometimes. <laughs> and just so I don't call only Japanese dead people <laughs> dumb dumb, so I'm going to throw under the bus a few of my own like people from my own uh, country or culture circle. Me, 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 me. <clears throat> so let's start off with people in Europe not washing themselves because for centuries because it was considered a sin. Like we have a saint in Poland that was known for not washing herself. Like ever. I'm looking at you, Saint Kinga. Me, 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 me. Next, in Zakopane there was actually a custom like some witch love potion magic bullcrap of putting menstrual blood in the food so that someone would fall in love with you. And just so you all know, Poland is like deeply Catholic country, so isn't that considered a witchcraft or something? <gasps> and it was even in the 19th century, so not that long ago. Me, me. Me, 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 me. Also our most beloved chief of state, then prime minister, mostly known for being absolutely amazing soldier and marshal, Piłsudski, once called his soldiers <clears throat> bunch of horse looking for love affairs in the forest and hills thinking only about their own cats. Also, the same man supposedly said that Polish nation is incredible, it's just the people are cats. However, you'd like to understand that statement, but <laughs> he was right. <laughs> so now that we have that out of the way, let's talk about how this sexy, I guess, monk almost manipulated Empress Shotoku into almost naming him the Japanese emperor and putting the end of the imperial family in the 8th century. This story takes place in the Nara period. Empress Shotoku was born as Princess Abe in 718 to Emperor Shomu, who, because he didn't have any male heirs, named her his heir, a crown princess. She was first and only woman who ever got that title. She wasn't the first empress in the history of Japan, before her there were actually five other women who sat on the Japanese throne, but they were never chosen as heirs by their predecessors, and only took the title before a male heir appeared. She wasn't also the only female ruler of Japan that actually had some kind of power at the court. Japan at the beginning of its existence was actually quite a matriarchal country, with Himiko as a supposed founder of the predecessor of Japan, Yamato country. Her importance as well as the influence of the rest of the empresses tends to go uh, diminished by the historians because they really don't like to acknowledge the way in which Japan operated before the Chinese influence that changed the position of women in Japan and is basically one of the reasons why they stopped appearing in Japanese history. Princess Abe actually sat on Japanese throne twice. During her first reign she took a name of Koken and ruled from 749 till 758. To then resign in favor of her male cousin who then was to become an emperor Junin, who she then overthrown <laughs> and established her second reign with the name of Shotoku, the second time she ruled from 764 till her death in 770. As I said, historians don't really like to admit that empresses had any kind of power or influence at the court. They prefer to popularize the idea that they were just puppets in the hands of the officials. Um, substitutes that were taking care of the throne before the eligible male candidate appears. And in some cases it was true, but it was true also for the other male emperors, but for in some cases empresses actually had a lot of power at the court, they were very influ influential politicians. And Shutoku can be counted as one of them. She actually, for example, took an active part in popularizing Buddhism and wasn't as passive as some historians want to portray her. And Buddhism at the time of Nara period when all of this is taking place was actually starting blooming in Japan and was starting to be properly established. Shotoku's father built one of the most famous Buddhist temples in Japan called Toleji with its most famous Buddha statue, but it wasn't until 752 under then Koken's rule when it was finally opened. As Princess Shotoku she also commissioned printing 1 million prayer charms, 
which was absolutely huge number at the time, and now those scrolls are one of the earliest prints still existing in the world. She also founded Otagi Nenbutsuji, a Buddhist temple in Arashiyama district in Kyoto. Her other doings at the court don't really paint a picture of a passive and submissive empress who was waiting for someone to take her power away from her either. She was a very well-educated, smart and ambitious young woman who not only had a title but actually took an active part in ruling the country. And actually Empress Koken didn't start her reign after her father's death, she started it after his abdication and on his deathbed he kind of changed his mind because Koken didn't have heirs of her own because she wasn't allowed to basically. He named her male cousin Prince Funado her heir, a crown prince. Koken didn't really like this change in mind and after her father's death she didn't listen <laughs> to his wishes and stripped that title of a crown prince away from Funado, claiming that he can't sit on the throne because he's not from direct bloodline of her father and she, he's not eligible to do that. This resulted in a coup led by Tachiba no Naramaro, an official and aristocrat who wanted to overthrow Koken and replace the most powerful of the officials at the court Fujiwara no Nakamaro with himself. She was able to win the coup, but because of the atmosphere at the court and the pressure she decided to retire and pass her title to the different cousin of hers, Prince Oi, later known as Emperor Junmin. And Fujiwara clan was actually a very influential family at the time. They basically made out of a lot of emperors their puppets and they were actually ruling the country through the hands of the emperors. In Nara period it was starting to establish itself, this kind of power dynamic between the Fujiwara clan and the emperor, imperial family. It wasn't as well established yet then, so a lot of emperors still had a lot of power, but they already started appearing the emperors that were just puppets in the hands of the Fujiwara clan, and actually Junin could be counted as one of them, because he was basically a puppet in the hands of Fujiwara no Nakamaro. But Koken didn't really disappear from the court after her um, abdication. She stayed at the court and she was a very loud and clear voice and she still had a lot of influence at the court and because of that she argued a lot. There were supposedly a lot of disputes between her and Fujiwara. And uh, that girl, so strong-willed and powerful and influential girl, getting herself played and manipulated. That's just sad. Anyways, during her time as a retired empress, she met a healer monk by the name of Dokyo, who apparently cured her of a disease. And they just became great friends. If you know what I mean. <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> Joey, we always know what you mean. <laughs> and after that fateful meeting in 762, Koken actually came back to the court and starting reorganizing the life there, basically. She claimed that Junin can't be an emperor anymore, he can't perform all the duties of the emperor because he's not from the direct bloodline of her father. She is. So she's supposed to perform the most like major duties of the emperor. So from then on, Junin started performing only the minor once, like for example the religious ceremonies and stuff, and she took on all the responsibility, all his power away from him, and she was in charge, basically, from now on. And that obviously started a dispute between her and Fujimara no Nakamaro, because stripping away the power away from Junin was basically stripping away the power away from him, from Fujiwara, and he didn't like it. But he didn't really have much to say, because after arguments and after a lot of fighting, he basically was forced to run away and then he got killed <laughs> as a traitor. <laughs> a similar thing happened to Junin. He wasn't killed obviously and he didn't really take an active part in all of those arguments and fights but he still was sent to an exile and condemned a traitor too. And that allowed Koken to take the throne once again, this time as Empress Shotoku. That turn of events clearly shows how influential and powerful of a politician Shotoku was. And yes, her further actions were most probably influenced by Dokyo, who tried to manipulate her a lot to grant himself the higher ranks. But he wouldn't be able to do it on his own, right? He needed, he needed her title, sure, but he also needed her knowledge, influence and power that she obviously had at the court, which again, such a smart, ruthless and influential politician getting herself manipulated like that. Was he really that hot? Or... Talented? <laughs> Anyways, after she took the throne, she actually reorganized the court further and she created two lines of command, one being the secular one and one being the religious one, and obviously our 
best friend Dokyo was in charge of the religious one, right? And Dokyo was actually the first ever monk on such a high position because monks or priests in general didn't really have a place at the court and that shook everyone and didn't really gain Shotoku popularity. And that decision resulted in never seen before integration between Buddhism and the court. And then Shotoku even established parallel officials, parallel ministers on both sides of her court, the religious and secular ones, and proclaimed Dokyo a prince of law. It is still unclear if that title gave him the power over the secular as well as the religious part of the court, but what is sure is that he was one of the most powerful officials at the time because of that title. And then came the ridiculous oracle that claimed that Dokyo was to be an emperor at some point to ensure the prosperity of the realm. What is this bullshit? There was never an emperor chosen this way and I must highlight here that Japanese imperial family is the longest running imperial family in the world. There was never a change in dynasties, though we can see here that it was very close in the 8th century. There are actually a few theories um, on the origins of that oracle, and the first one, and the most popular one, is that it was actually Dokyo's plan to, to become an emperor, which I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case, given how he manipulated Koken up until this point to get into the place of power. Second theory, however, states that it was actually secular officials' plan of getting rid of Dokyo because they hoped that after such a ridiculous oracle, Koken would consider him a threat and basically chase him away. But jokes on them, it had absolutely opposite effect on her and she was actually planning on doing just that. Girl! The last theory, however, states that it was actually Shotoku's plan to provide herself with an heir because who would be better than our beloved monk, right? The guy that manipulated her so many times just to get powerful and get higher ranks at the court. For sure not someone from her actual bloodline. Fuck those guys. I personally would lean more into the second theory, I think, because after Shotoku's death, who thank god wasn't able to announce Tokyo an emperor beforehand. They were very fast to move the capital from Nara to Kyoto to distance themselves from the Buddhist influence and, and the monks who were getting more and more powerful and they obviously knew that they were a threat. And Tokyo after that entire debacle just got sent into exile, obviously. <laughs> To this day, it's unclear if Dokyo and Koken were just friends or political partners or lovers. And I personally would like to believe the last one true, because if that girl almost gave up an entire country and basically betrayed her entire bloodline for a guy, then at least I hope he was as good in bed as he was with the prayer beads. It is just my personal theory, but I think that in her religious feelings, Tokyo saw an opportunity and manipulated her based on that. Um, she was not allowed to marry, she was not allowed to have kids, because she was still considered, even though she was very powerful and influential at the court, she was still considered just a substitute for an emperor. She was just holding on to the throne before some eligible male candidate appears, right? I think because of that, she was a very lonely person. And Dokyo saw an opportunity in this religious, lonely, middle-aged woman who was longing for a partner in her life and all he had to do was provide her with sutras for her religious life and some warmth maybe for her private life. Whether or not he actually wanted to push his luck into becoming an emperor, I'm not sure, but he for sure manipulated her to become the most powerful official at the court. Whichever theory is true, when I visited the remains of the Nara palace, all I could think of was that girl that almost gave up an entire country for a dude. A dude. An entire country? Really? The history of this intelligent but nevertheless a dumb dumb is one of many reasons why empresses to this day are unheard of. And after Shotoku there were actually two more empresses, but centuries later and during the shogunate era, so they had no power whatsoever. After that, however, there was absolutely no one else and unfortunately our powerful ruler, a dumb <laughs> but powerful ruler, is cited as one of the reasons why that is. Which regardless of what she's done or almost done, I think it's just an excuse. Of course, it's one of the reasons, but it wouldn't be a main reason. The main reason I would look for in Confucianism and the Chinese influence and slowly change the laws and the mindsets of the people. So, in my opinion, if you need to blame someone for I cannot becoming an empress in the next few years, then blame more this guy rather than this girl.